الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وابتغوا إليه الوسيلة Please recite الصلوات <coughs> Respected listeners, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a friend. He lives in Norway. He is an uh, IT specialist, highly educated, very practicing Shia Muslim. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, he said something to me. He said that he had a faith-related dilemma. He said that uh, he could not decide when doing tawassul whether he should speak to Allah or he should speak to the Imam. He did not understand the meaning of tawassul. If you speak to the Imam, how come that is tawassul? And if you speak directly to Allah, then what does that have to do with the Imam? And he said that he had this issue very much uh, when he went on the ziyara, and then he was confused what to do. You stand there in front of the zarih and you don't really know. You're supposed to speak to the Imam or you're supposed to speak to the to the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many people, believe me, who have this kind of confusion. And tawassul is one of those topics that has been discussed and debated uh, throughout the history of Islam. And uh, it continues to be debated today. And there are many different kinds of points of view in the Muslim Ummah, um, the different congregations, different schools of thought about Tawassul. And also nowadays among Shia Muslims, we have different points of view when it comes to Tawassul and the limits of Tawassul and what Tawassul means. Now, one thing is Tawassul. Then there is another thing, there is another confusion and misconception. And uh, that is Tafweed. The other day, I gave a lecture with the topic Tawakkul and Tafweed, in which Tafweed meant that you hand yourself over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is like bottom-up approach. You hand yourself over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in this context, the same word Tafweed is used for another thing which is very wrong. And let me explain that to you. Uh, with the help of something that someone said. There was a discussion going on again in Norway about Tawassul and the limit of Tawassul and uh, the powers of the Ahlul Bayt and this and that. And one brother who was so sure that he understood the concept, he said to everyone, let me explain this to you, as if he had really got the point. And he said, you know, if I was the owner of a city and I owned it and I had the keys to that city, and I handed those keys over to you and I said, now you do whatever you want to do in this city, but I will remain the owner. Then what's the problem with that? And that is Tawassul. And I did not get into arguments with that brother. And I was not into theology and I hadn't started public speaking anywhere at that time. And I thought this is a thinking that many people have. This is very wrong that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything and he remains the owner, but he says to the Ahlul Bayt, now you do whatever you want to do. That is very haram, very wrong. And that is Tafweed. Inshallah, I'm going to shed some light on the concept of Tawassul and Tafweed in this lecture. And this is a very important topic because believe me, many people have issues with tawassul they do not understand what tawassul is can you say ya ali madad can you say ya zahra adrikni what does it mean aren't we supposed to seek help only and only from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so on and so forth
And recently there have been people in the Shia community who have vehemently uh, rejected Tawassul and have said that this is not good. You cannot speak directly to the Imams and so on. So what you are going to learn during the next 50 minutes or so today is the following. First of all, a very brief definition of Tawassul, the very basic definition of the word Tawassul, what does it mean? And after that, um, three main types of Tawassul. I'm going to uh, discuss three main types of Tawassul, out of which one is the most problematic one. And that's what I'll spend quite some time on. And in doing so, I will also uh, conduct a mental exercise that will help you understand some very basic fundamental concepts, which is very important in the context of this topic, inshallah. And in doing so, I'll also touch upon the subject of shirk. What are the limits of shirk? What is shirk and what is not shirk? And then in the last part of this lecture, of course, I'll take a look at uh, the history and uh, to give the historical accounts of some of the events that took place on the night leading to the day of Ashura and on the day of Ashura and recite a detailed eulogy for Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, inshallah. But before I proceed, please recite a loud salawat. Oh. I recited a part of verse number 35 of Surah Al-Ma'idah in the opening sermon in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha wa bataghu ilayhi al-wasila. Or those who believe, have taqwa of Allah, have piety, and seek wasila towards him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says, seek wasila towards him. But what does wasila mean? Wasila, a simple translation of the word wasila can be means, means towards him. But the translation of it that is found in the different translations and the works of exegesis is wasila in this context means means to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to us. He's closer to the, the main vein. So why does he say that seek wasila? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be reached directly just like that. We need some means to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are those wasila? What is that wasila? We see in the different works of exegesis that the wasila is a salat. And this is true. Best wasila, one of the one of the best wasilas is namaz, salat, obligatory prayers. In my point of view, there are two categories of wasila to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first part of this lecture is going to be a little bit more academic, and then I promise that it's going to become more light, and inshallah, you are going to enjoy it a bit more, inshallah. So please pay attention. So wasila, there can be two main categories of wasila. First kind of wasila is faith, salat, Psalm, good deeds, and all that. Those things which do not have irada. Salat is an act, but does not have an irada of its own. Does not have a will of its own. It's something that we do. It's a wasila with the help of which we seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second category the second category of wasila is the one that has irada. And they are the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt. They not only that they have irada, the willpower, but their irada is diffused into the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not even think anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want. They do not even do anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want. What they say is truth. Not only that, what they say becomes the truth. Ali ma'al haq wal haqq ma'a Ali. Ali is with the truth. 
And truth is with Ali. The Holy Prophet prayed, Oh Allah, turn the haq towards Ali. Wherever Ali goes, make haq go there. So haq follows Ali. Yeah, Ali. So this irada is superior. This wasila with the irada is superior to the other wasila because Shimmer was also reciting salat. Ibn Muljim also recited Salat. Daesh are also reciting Salat. Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and all those, they are also fasting Salat, this, that, homes, oh, sorry, not homes, of course not. I mean, charity and all that. But they don't have that wasila which has the irada. That shaitan cannot enter, cannot intervene in at all. So we take them as wasila, okay? But what does it mean to take them as wasila? Tawassul, the word itself means seeking nearness to Allah, speaking to Allah. The basic, the basic definition of tawassul is speaking to Allah, um, giving him the reference of the wasila. Bihaqti Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The first kind of tawassul, the very basic kind of tawassul is that we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, fulfill my wishes. Bihaqti Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This is the, the, only, the only type of tawassul that is like 100% tawassul. And that is like the, uh, the definition of tawassul. The other two types that I'm going to discuss have a separate name. But usually, collectively, they fall under the category of tawassul. I'll speak about that in a bit. So for now, Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, for the sake of the Holy Prophet and his progeny, we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, oh Allah, I am weak. I don't do all those wajibat wholeheartedly. Sometimes I even miss a salat and all that. But... I like to associate with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I aspire to be in their camp. So please forgive me. Fulfill my wishes for the sake of the Holy Prophet and his progeny. Perfect tawassul, beautiful. No one has any problem with that. No one has any problem with that. Even the Wahhabis with this kind of tawassul, perhaps unless they're very, very extremists, wouldn't have any problem with that. And it's proven throughout the history, people used to do this kind of tawassul. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them. We are showing our affiliation with the Holy Prophet. We are expressing that we believe in the Holy Prophet. We believe in the finality of the prophethood of the Holy Prophet. We believe in the walaya of the progeny of the Holy Prophet. And through this expression, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. Okay, no problem with that. Now the second type of tawassul is when you speak to the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Now, that is technically not tawassul because now you're not speaking to Allah, but you're speaking to someone else. So it is istighatha. You are asking them to help you, basically. But collectively, for simplicity's sake, usually it also is called tawassul. In that, you don't ask them to help you. You ask them to pray for you. You say to the Holy Prophet, please pray for me that Allah forgives me. Oh, Imam. Ask Allah to give something to me. Ask Allah to give me children, give me job, give me wealth, cure me, this, that, whatever your wishes are. Also, this kind of tawassul or istighatha is not problematic. Well, one particular kind of uh, uh, Muslims, they find it problematic. But usually, this is also not that problematic. And even uh, among the Shia community, this is somehow uh, accepted largely because you're asking them to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they hear you, they see you. When we go to Ziyara, we say, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. So the Holy Prophet replies because we say salam and reply of salam is wajib. The Holy Prophet replies, but we can't hear it. The Amir al-Mu'mineen replies, but we can't hear it. When we say salam from here, 
they reply, but we can't hear it because we have these barriers in the form of sins and our heart is consumed by dunya. So we can't hear that. But Urafa hear that. There have been people who used to hear it, the, the, the reply, Wa alaykum salam. They used to hear that. Now, nowadays, if we go to Medina, we are not allowed to stand there in front of the Zari and speak to the Holy Prophet, but we can stand in the, the courtyard outside in the Medina Mosque and speak to the Holy Prophet. It's no problem. It's all right. Because in the Quran, there is that uh, the brothers of Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, when they wanted to repent, they went to their father, Prophet Yaqub, peace be upon him, and said, Ya Aba, Abana, istaghfir lana. Our father, O oh father, please pray for us. Do istighfar for us. So he said, soon I will do istighfar for you. He did not say no, seek directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did istighfar for his sons. Now someone would say, okay, he did. But he was alive. The Holy Prophet is not there in front of you. He is, God forbid, dead. How come you can speak to dead? And this is one of the objections they have on this kind of tawassul. The objection to this kind of tawassul is, how come you can speak to dead? They don't hear you. They're dead. And this is such a big misconception. Is the Holy Prophet dead? Are your relatives, may Allah shower his mercy upon their souls who have passed away, are they dead? Well, they are dead. Let me tell you today, yesterday I talked about death. I talked about nafs and all that. Let me tell you, no one is dead. No one is dead, dead. Neither Habil nor Qabil. Neither Musa nor Fir'aun. Neither Ibrahim nor Namrud. Neither Abu Jahl nor the Holy Prophet. Neither Hussein nor Yazid. Even Yazid is not dead. We say Yazid yet Murdabad. We say death to Yazidism, his ideology. But Yazid, the person, is still alive. If he was dead, then how would he face the consequences? How would he see his ugly deeds? No one is dead because what happens at the time of death? Nafs transitions into the next world, has acquired all the knowledge, all the akhlaq, and all those things, and transitions into the other world. Is not dead, can see can hear but those who lived all their life committing sins being disobedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acting like a pharaoh being a taghut being dictators like namrud yazid muawiyah and all those people who were so free to do whatever in this world their nafs used their body to do whatever in this world when they transition into the next world, they become completely chained. They're not free to do anything. But those who spent their whole life serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had some limitation in this world because they had this body in this 3D, 4D world. But when they pass away, when they go to the next world, their nafs has no limitation. They are completely free with all the knowledge and all the power. They are not dead, dead. They are not. And those who are shuhada, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says in the Holy Quran, لا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون those who die in the way of Allah do not think that they are dead, but they are alive with their Lord, with Allah, and they are yurzaqun. They receive rizq. What is rizq? For us, rizq is a roti, naan, rice, biryani, halim, kichro, all these things. Or if we think about the hereafter, we think about pomegranates and milk and honey and all those things. But no, that is not the only form of rizq. Rizq can be ilm, 
which can be access to the secrets of the existence, access to the keys, to the locks in the entire existence, a power to unlock the locks, open the doors, and what not. And the Imam says that our ilm is constantly increasing. The Imam says our ilm is constantly increasing. It is in Kafi. The Imam says that every Thursday night, the the souls of all the prophets and all the imams fly towards the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Over there, ilm is given to the holy prophet, not to anyone else. No one to the holy prophet and through his wasila is given to all the prophets and all the imams every Thursday night. Even Ali is muhtaj of Muhammad. Even the Imams require the wasila of the Holy Prophet to get that ilm that is constantly increasing. Why it is constantly increasing? This is mind boggling. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlimited. His knowledge is unlimited. So now we have two infinities. Which means Allah is ilm. Allah is ilm which is unlimited. And no one can reach infinity. Even the Holy Prophet. Despite all their ilm, their ilm is constantly increasing and God knows what is that ilm. God knows what is that ilm. And that ilm has nothing to do with body. That ilm has everything to do with nafs and nafs does not die. Ali pulled the door of Khaybar not with the power of his body. He pulled the door of Khaybar with the power of his nafs. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, raised the dead, not with the power of his body. He did with the power of his nafs. All the prophets, everyone who performed miracles was with the power of their nafs, not with the power of body. And the nafs is alive. They see us, they hear us, and that's why they can help us. First of all, they can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even our parents pray to, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for when people send gifts to their dead ones, to their parents, they pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses those children who send gifts for their parents in the form of charity and all that. But then can they help us? This brings me to the third kind of tawassul, which is the problematic. When you ask them directly, please help me. Please help me. And this is the problem. This can be shirk. Actually, it can be shirk if we misunderstand it. If we misunderstand it. And in order to understand what is shirk, in order to understand this concept of tawassul and tafweed and shirk and asking directly from the imams and all that, let us do a mental exercise that will help you solve many of your dilemmas. So please follow my instructions, but first recite a salawat. So now, a very short mental exercise, please follow my instructions. Close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes and follow my instructions. Please close your eyes. Now imagine a lion. And give it the shape you want it to have. Its hair, its tail, the features, the way you want it to be. The lion stands next to a stream of water in the middle of a forest. And sometimes it looks to the right and sometimes to the left. Now open your eyes and recite a salawat. <laughs> So the topic of this lecture is Tawassul and Tafweed. And this is a very important topic. And so far I have discussed two types of Tawassul. The first one is when you uh, speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. 
and you say to him that, Oh Allah, please fulfill my wishes for the sake of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And that is okay. The second kind of tawassul is that you speak to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, or the Imams, and you say to them, please pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me, for my forgiveness, to fulfill my wishes, and so on and so forth. And then the third kind of tawassul is, which can be problematic. And that is the, the, the biggest objections are to this kind of tawassul, which is Ya Ali Madad, asking directly from the Holy Prophet, asking directly from the Imams, because after all, how can you seek help directly from someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do they even have the powers to help you? And what does it mean, right? This is what I'm discussing now, but now I have a question. So while I've been discussing this, since you opened your eyes and recited the salawat and you've been listening to me, paying attention to my words and processing my words, what was your lion doing in the meantime? What did it do in the meantime? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is what you think now. This is what you want it to do now, because you now are imagining that line. The, the reality is, as soon as you open your eyes and I made you recite salawat and deliberately said different things so that you'll pay attention to me, so that as soon as your attention was away from that line, it ceased to exist. It disappeared, it vanished. It totally and absolutely depends on you to exist. You are hai, so you gave hayat to that lion. You exist, so you gave existence to that lion. What you are to that lion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to the whole creation. And the whole creation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing more than just a thought. And if he takes away his thought, for a second, everything would cease to exist. Everything. That's why the Ayma used to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, do not leave us on our own, even for the blink of an eye. Because they had that ma'rifah. That is Al-Qayyum. That is Al-Qayyum who keeps, Al-Qayyum means the one who sustains the existence, not only creates, but sustains you constantly need the attention the thought of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to power you to power your actions to power everything you do and this includes everyone the holy prophet the amir al mu'minin the 14 infallibles all the prophets anything and everything that exists is absolutely and totally dependent on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever and ever and ever in all planes of existence in this world in the hereafter in barzakh in akhirah bahisht jannah jahannam and all that everything all the time this is very important and the lion can never ever ever get out of your kingdom your lion can never ever get out of your kingdom you can give the lion the power the power to attack or attack this do this do that you can give this lion the power to even create other lions for example even then that lion cannot claim that it creates it does those things because it is nothing without you it is absolutely and totally dependent on you so it is not possible that you hand over your powers to that lion it is mahale akli it is impossible it is rationally impossible that you hand over your powers to the lion and the lion also exists and you also exist it is rationally impossible similarly tafweed is impossible it is not like that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the ahlul bayt and then he says i hand over my powers to you now you do whatever you want to do in my kingdom that is haram that is shirk and what is shirk shirk is to to believe that ali 
or the 14 infallibles or anyone can exist independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone believes that, that is shirk. Other than that, it's okay. As long as your belief is in the right place that Ali is a slave of Allah. Ali cannot breathe, breathe without Allah. Ali cannot exist without Allah. Ali cannot even move an inch without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Ali also recited in the prayers, Bihawlillahi wa quwwatihi aqoomu wa qurd. I cannot even stand up or sit down without the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as that you believe, then you can even seek help directly from them. Even then, but then you will say, what about that? We seek help only from you. What about that? So you cannot seek help from anyone else. Well, the thing is, in our life, we are seeking help from other people all the time. All the time. But as soon as it becomes something big, we don't want to seek help from them. We say, oh, this they can't help me with. They can give me a glass of water, but they can't give me a child. They can help me with fixing my car, but they cannot cure me. They can cure me through medicine, but they cannot cure me just like that. So you are telling me that drinking a glass of water without the help of God is okay? Now let me unfold this to you. All the things that happen in this world, anyone who performs any action has, is very little in the eyes of Allah. From the blowing of the trumpet by Israfil to performing great, great things by Jibrail to taking the souls by Israel to bringing the rain down and giving risk by Mikail to pulling off the door of Khaybar by Ali ibn Abi Talib to raising the dead by Isa alayhi salam to splitting the Red Sea in 12 streams by Musa alayhi salam to a coronavirus moving. It's all nothing in the sight of Allah. It's all equal. Could I explain this? For him, for him, it is no one should misunderstand. From our perspective, these are great things. But for Allah, it does not matter a great thing or small thing. It's all powered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I meant. It's all powered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a mullah would come and say, no, you cannot seek help from this. You cannot seek help from that. But you know, I eat biryani on my own with my own power. Do you ask Allah? May Allah, oh Allah, may I eat biryani? No one asks that. No one thinks that you can't even eat without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot. So if you do a small thing on your own and you believe that I can really do this on my own, but I cannot get something big on my own, that is shirk. Because small thing or big thing, you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all that. For everything. And now, question comes, but do they really have the powers to help you? Do they really, the imams? Well, where is the limit of their ilm? Because in order to help you, they need ilm. Without knowledge, you can't help anyone. So what, where is their ilm? Do we even know? Uh, does the Quran tell us about their ilm? They have ilm or not? And what kind of ilm they have? So let me explain this to you with the help of a Quranic narrative. What does it mean w about, about their ilm? So Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, he once asked his courtiers, who will bring the throne of Bilqis, who lived in Yemen? Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. Now, Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam was a great king, king of kings. And he had control, he had tasarruf and authority over the wind and the, the jinns and the animal kingdom and all that. And he could understand the language of the animals. He could have conversations with ants. He could have. So one day he asked his courtiers, who will bring the throne of Bilqis? And there was this man who brought it. 
but before he brought it, one of his courtiers was Ifrit a jinn. According to the Quran, he said, Qala ifritum min al -jinn. The, 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 from, from among the jinn who was a great create, creature, that I will bring it for you before you get up from your place, which means a few minutes. Some interpretations say that it meant uh, before you um, end this assembly of this meeting that might take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, something like that, which is still very little. He lived in Levant and Yemen was far away. So if he could go and get it within half an hour, that would be a great deed. Now, Stad Jawadi Amali says that jinns have the power to move very fast and bring things very quickly. They have that power. So he said, I can bring it. Now, according to the Quran, Prophet Sulaiman did not allow him to do that. He could bring it, but he would have to go and get it. He would have to fetch it physically. Then there was another man. There was another man who had some ilm from the kitab. Another man. He said, I will bring it to you in the blink of an eye. That means this. He brought it. Now, in the blink of an eye, you cannot go and get it physically. In the blink of an eye means you get it with the power of kun fayakun. The power of kun fayakun. Because in the blink of an eye, just, you think and it's here. Think and it's here. And that man had ilmum min al kitab. He had some ilm from the book. What is that book? I'll get back to it in a bit. Ilmum min al kitab. Some ilm from the book. He brought it. Who was that man? All the works of exegesis, Sunni and Shia, they write that he was Asif ibn Barkhiya, who was a cousin of Prophet Sulaiman. And he was his successor, his wazir, his wasi, his khalifa. He was not a prophet, but he was his wazir. Now, if I were there, in my imagination, if I were there, I would say to Prophet, prophet Sulaiman, my master, you are king of kings. You have this kingdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to none before you and will give to none after you. You have this power. You have tasarruf, authority. You have wilayatu taqwiniya. Why did you ask others to bring this throne? Why did you do that? In my imagination, Prophet Sulaiman would say to me, Rayhan, you don't know what I know. You can't see what I see in my imagination. In my imagination. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me, you do not know. This is my wasi. I am an ordinary prophet. I am an ordinary prophet. This is my wasi. He does not receive any revelation. He does not bring any book. He does not bring any sharia. And I am an ordinary prophet. There is this final messenger. My prophethood depends on his prophethood. My light depends on his light. My wilaya depends on his wilaya, the final messenger. In the end of times, there will be people who would use beautiful words, expensive words. They will talk about tawheed, and in doing so, they would cast doubts on the ilm and authority of the wasi, of the final prophet. This is my wasi. He does not receive revelation. He does not receive any sharia, but still he has the power of kun fayakun because he has some ilm from the book. But then the wasi of the final messenger has that ilm which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would document in his verbatim word in the final message and descend it upon the heart of the final messenger when the pagans would doubt his prophethood he would say 
and my wasi can do that so what can he do chaman chaman kali kali nagar nagar kali 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 Now the question is, what is Al-Kitab? One might say, what does Al-Kitab mean? What is that book on the basis of which Asif ibn Barkhiyah could do that? Now Al-Kitab, some people say, it means the knowledge of the Quran. Al-Kitab means the Quran. Now that would be very simple, to be honest. Although Quran is great, Quran is azim. If someone has knowledge of the whole Quran, On the basis of that, one can perform many, many miracles, what not. But still, here Al-Kitab does not mean the Quran. How could Asif ibn Barakhiyah have the knowledge of Al-Quran at that time, some ilm? It does not mean Torah either. If it meant Torah, then Asif ibn Barakhiyah would have not some ilm of it. He would have all the ilm of Torah because that was their book. So what is Al-Kitab here? Then we look at different works of exegesis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Quran Kareem is in Kitabun Maknoon. The Quran itself is in a Kitabun Maknoon, a secret book, a protected book. And when we look in different works of exegesis, here Al-Kitab means Lawh Mahfuz, the encrypted disk. That contains all the knowledge. Allah's knowledge is unlimited. All the knowledge, Allah Mahfuz contains all the knowledge related to the creation. All the books, all the knowledge trickles down from Lawh Mahfuz. The Quran itself comes from Lawh Mahfuz. Torah, Injil, Zabur, Quran, all the universal laws of physics, all the things that govern the whole universe, everything comes from Lawh Mahfuz because Lawh Mahfuz is an image, a limited image of the unlimited knowledge of God. Lawh Mahfuz is like a very, very big mirror put under the sky and sky is unlimited and then it reflects up as much of the sky as is its capacity. Still limited, but still very, very big and unlimited in relation to us. Ali ibn Abi Talib has knowledge of Lawh Mahfuz. And once someone has that, is above the universal laws of physics. This we need to understand properly. Because nowadays there are people who want to take you away from the Ahlul Bayt in the name of Allah. The irony is that. And sometimes I go to congregations and I see that sometimes some people, some young men, younger brothers and sisters say, we want to discuss our social issues, we want to discuss our social problems and all that. And I say those things are very important and we need to discuss contemporary issues. But we do not have to compromise on the fadail of the Ahlul Bayt. My brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, contemporary issues will be solved if we had that love for the Ahlul Bayt. If we understood the maqam of the Ahlul Bayt, with that love will come the solutions to our social issues. Yeah. I said, Dige, Imam Hussein should be mashgale. Imam Hussein mashgale na boshad. Without Quran, without Hadith, without the Fadail of the Ahlul Bayt, social issues, we can discuss the whole whole year, 365 days, but in Muharram, yes, we should discuss social issues, we should discuss contemporary issues, and I have done myself, and it's very important, 
but not compromising on the fadail of the Ahlul Bayt. So then, kun fayakun, let me unfold this last bit before I move on to the final, final part. And I will also tell you a personal anecdote because I have to conclude this lecture and I know there can be some ambiguities and there can be some confusions. And if there, I, I will try my best not to leave any, but if there are any, inshallah, we can discuss later. So kun fayakun, I say, Kun fayakun. Jesus had kun fayakun. Asif and Barkhiyah had kun fayakun. The Amir al Mu'minin, the Holy Prophet had kun fayakun. People say, What this kufr? You're doing kufr. Mullah will come and say kufr. Because these people who come and appear as intellectuals, because they are the, the champions of Tawheed. They are the contractors of Tawheed, like in colloquially we say in South Asian languages. Yeah? But such a superficial understanding of Tawheed when you want to uh, make Ahlul Bayt, the Fadail of Ahlul Bayt and Tawheed uh, mutually exclusive. So they would say, Kun Fayakun is Kufr. I'll say, not only Ali ibn Abi Talib, even you have the power of Kun Fayakun. Allah, okay, not only you, every human being, even those who are sitting in pubs at this very moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a glimpse of kun fayakun inside us all. Now, another small sort of um, mental exercise. I want you to imagine a mango. Well, I like Multani mangoes. They're very sweet. You can imagine any type of mango. Watermelon, apple. Now, as soon as you wanted to imagine a mango, was there any delay between your irada and ijad of mango? Any? The technical term, irada and ijad. Irada means will, willing to want something, and ijad, it's creation. Was there any delay? No delay. Kun fayakun. Kun fayakun. Everyone has that power. A glimpse of kun fayakun. It is. The problem is with our irada that it is very weak. It is so weak that we can only fantasize about things. We can never create it in the kharij, in the outer world, outside of our brain. But those who have spent all their life in service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who don't do anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want them to do, whose irada is diffused into the irada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their irada is so strong that they can even create it in the kharij. That's why, that's why when the Imam, the eighth Imam pointed towards that lion on the carpet and turned that 2D figure into a 3D living lion. He did that. Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, had a 3D lifeless object and he would turn it into a 3D living organism. These are only converting from 2Ds to 3Ds, 3Ds to 3Ds. Then Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, said, I will create for you. I create for you a sort of a model, a minatine from, from clay. I create for you a, a model of a bird. And then what do I do? I blow into it, fayakunu tayra. Fayakun. I blow into it, fayakun the bird. Ustad Javadi Amuli says, in this verse there is fayakun. Where is kun? Where is kun? You say Allah does kun fayakun. The blowing of Prophet Jesus is equivalent to Allah's kun. And then for Yakunu the bird, it flies away. That, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a Babaji with a long beard sitting on clouds saying, kun, 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 kun. He doesn't work like that. He works through this causes and effects. And sometimes 
the cause has to be the wasila of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sometimes he says, you keep praying, you keep praying, but until you use them as the wasila, I won't fulfill your wish. Sometimes, but still we can have this confusion. So I had this confusion. In 2013, I went from Qum to Mashhad, and I had this uh, confusion. Can I speak to the Imam? Can I ask help from the Imam and all that? So I went to Mashhad and then I met Ayatollah Sayyid Husseini Ayazi, a great guy, such a nice teacher and alim and teacher of akhlaq. He was very kind to give me half an hour or so. And he's so humble that he calls himself Hujjatul Islam, although he's Ayatollah, and he leads the prayers in the main hall in Mashhad. So I said to him, Agha, when I go to the Zarih, I become confused. Uh, I, I want to speak only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to the Imam. He said, Mashallah, very nice. It's a good thing to do. I said, and what if I spoke directly to the Imam? He said, Mashallah, very beautiful, very good thing to do. <laughs> I said, Aga, what are you saying? Both are very good things to do. He said something very interesting. He said, Agar Dalil Doshte Bashid, Shirk Mirk Hitchinist. He said, if you have a logical reasoning behind what you do, there is no shirk. <laughs> That's why I tend to say sometimes there is one sentence a Malang says and it becomes shirk and an Arif says the same sentence and it becomes pure Tawheed because Arif's points of view and the basic concepts are so clear, so clear. So my brothers and sisters, speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. The Imams used to do that. It's very pleasurable. It's very beautiful. He listens, but also you can speak to the Imam sometimes. It is not shirk. It is not shirk. Some Urafa prefer to speak to the Imam. Some Urafa prefer to speak to the Imam. It's their point of view. It's their humility. Some people believe, some Urafa believe that it is a sign of arrogance to try to reach Allah directly. Who are you? Look at yourself. You want to bypass the Ahlul Bayt and reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Good luck, mate. No one can bypass the perfect human being and reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So my brothers and sisters, first of all, understand this, what is shirk? Anything and everything depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the Rabb of Ali and our Rabb. Gives him risk and gives us risk. They are just a manifestation of his names, a manifestation of his wilaya. That's it. But we are also, we also sometimes manifest some of his attributes. Just as I said, kun fayakun in our mind. But on a much weaker level. On a much smaller level, the perfect human being manifests that on the most perfect and the purest level. That's what they do. So speak to Allah directly, but you can also speak to the Imam if your basic concepts are in the right place. If they are not, if you are confused, do not speak to the Imam directly, I would say. Because I'm not here to please the people. I don't want to leave any ambiguities. If you are afraid that even for a second you will think that Imam Hussain can do whatever he wants on his own in the kingdom of God, that his irada is somewhat separate from the irada of God and you have difficulty understanding that, then do not speak to him. Speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me, this, this is what I want you to be very clear about, but rationally speaking, it's no problem. It's very nice thing to do, and some Urafa prefer to speak to them and get a lot of blessings through them because whatever blessing comes to us comes through the 14 infallibles. Whatever blessing comes. 
Even if you ask directly from him, he will send them through the 14 infallibles. How does that work? What is that mechanism? Is outside the scope of this lecture. But what we need to do, we need to associate with them. And when it, we associate with them, we need to obey them. And we can obey them even today. Even today, we can obey them. How? By following the Sharia. By following their akhlaq. This is very important. And there was this man who had absolutely submitted to the ulul amr of his time, to the imam of his time. Complete obedience to the imam of his time. As a result of which, the sixth imam wrote his ziyarat nama. The sixth imam, Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, wrote the ziyarat nama of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And we don't see that any infallible personality writes ziyarah of someone who is not infallible. Because Abbas alayhi salam was not among the 14 infallibles. But he wrote, and he said, As-salamu alayka ya ayyuhal abdu salih al-muti'u lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li amir al-mu'mineen wa al-hasani wa al-husayn. O pious slave of Allah, salam be upon you, who obeyed Allah, obeyed the Holy Prophet, obeyed the Amir al muminin obeyed Hassan and obeyed Hussein. Abbas never even saw the Holy Prophet. How come you obeyed the Holy Prophet? Through obedience to Hussein, through obedience to Hassan, through obedience to Ali. And that is equivalent to obedience to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Book, Man rasul faqad ata Allah. And whoever obeys the Prophet indeed obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore Abbas had reached a level that is very unique. Very unique. It is said that on the day of judgment, martyrs will wish that we had a status like the status of Abbas. All the martyrs. He had, he had diffused his will into the will of Hassan and Hussein. He was 14 when the Amir al Mu'minin was martyred. And he had three other brothers from the same mother, Umul Banin. Umul Banin raised her sons without the Amirul Mu'mineen on her own. And she raised them for that day. That day when they would sacrifice themselves for Hussein, their master, their Ulul Amr, their Mawla, their Imam. And Abbas never, ever gave suggestions to Imam Hassan or Imam Hussein. Never. Why should I give suggestions to my master, my Imam? There were people who used to give suggestions to the Imams. Please go there, do this, do that. They were well wishers. They were believers. They were loyal to the Imam, but still they did not have that level of ma'rifah which Abbas had. The Imam does not need my suggestions. Never questioned anything. Whatever the Imam said, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, yes, master. Whatever the Imam wanted from him, he would just do that. On the night leading to the day of Ashura, Lady Zainab, peace be upon her, narrates that she saw Abbas sitting with his three brothers from the same mother, Ummul Banin. And Abbas said to them, tomorrow is going to be a battle. What have you thought to do? And his brother said, we are going to sacrifice our lives for our master. Hussein. When Abbas heard that, he said, this is exactly what I am going to do as well. Now, Shimr, the accursed man, was a distant relative of Abbas from his mother's side. Umul Banin and Shimr were from the same tribe. 
So Shemr the accursed, when he left Kufa, he went to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyan and he said, please write a letter of amnesty for the sons of my sister. So he brought that amnesty. On the night leading to the day of Ashura, Abbas and his brothers were sitting in the tent of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And Shimr the accursed came saying out loud, where are the sons of my sister? Where are the sons of my sister? When Abbas heard that, he did not reply to Shimr. Imam Hussein said to Abbas, reply to him, although he is fasiq, although he is a sinner, reply to him, go listen to him. Then Abbas went. Shimr the accursed man said to Abbas, listen, the sons of my sister, tomorrow is going to be a battle. I have this letter of amnesty for you. If you do not join, you can leave now. Abbas said to Shimr, curse be upon your letter of amnesty and upon you. I am here to sacrifice my life for my master Hussain. Abbas returned. The accursed enemy had cut off the water supplies for three days. But Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, had collected water. They would use water wisely and in during these three days, they would also try and go and get some water. So there was some water left, which eventually finished on the day of Ashura, they ran out of water at one point. This is written in Hamas Husayni by Ustad Mutahari. And then hot weather. Children were scared. The sounds of horses, the rattling of swords, the martyrs, the bodies of martyrs being brought bloodshed on top of that hunger and thirst and the children started to cry al atash al atash thirst thirst when all the companions of imam hussein were martyred then the beni hashim started to go to the battlefield one after the other one after the other one after the other the Imam did not allow Abbas to go to the battlefield. Abbas, you shall not go to fight. You're the commander of my army. Abbas was not allowed to go to fight. Until no one was left. Sajjad cannot fight. He's suffering from ailment. Who else is left? Hussein and Abbas. Abbas goes to Imam Hussain alayhi salam. My master, please now allow me to go to the battlefield. No, Abbas, you are the commander of my army. There is no army. My master, please let me go. Okay, Abbas, if you want to go, go fetch water for children. Sakina, Baqir, Ali al Asghar, small children, all thirsty, crying, Al Atash, Al Atash. Abbas says, Yes, my master. It is written in the books of Maqtal that the accursed enemy had deployed 4,000 soldiers on the banks of the river Euphrates. So that not a single drop of water should reach the camp of Hussein. The vultures would drink water from the river. The pigs and dogs would drink the water from Euphrates, but it should not reach the children of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Abbas gets ready to go to the river. He had a water skin with him. The narrator says that Abbas got on his horse, the son of the conqueror of Khaybar. The brave man, Abbas, moves forward. 4,000 soldiers guarding the Euphrates. 
The brave son of Ali moves forward and puts up a fierce fight, disperses the enemy. It is written in the books of Maktal that he killed more than 80 accursed men and his horse entered the Euphrates. The narrator says, I saw Abbas's horse entering the river and the belly of his horse was touching the surface of the water. And then he saw something strange. Abbas took some water in his palm, brought it closer to his mouth. The narrator thought Abbas was going to drink water. How could Abbas drink water when Zainab was thirsty? When Umm Kulthum was thirsty? When Ali al Asghar was at the verge of dying because of thirst? When his master Hussein was thirsty? The peak of loyalty, the peak of love. Abbas threw the water back onto the surface of the river, filled the water skin, got out of the river. Now Abbas has only one aim, only one aim, to get the water skin back to the camp of Hussein. One aim. Abbas's life is in the water skin. Abbas's soul is in the water skin. Abbas's heart is in the water skin. It is written in the books of Maktal that this time Abbas changed the route on the way back and went through the oasis. And then the accursed enemy who was still in the aftershocks from the previous attack by Abbas, they hashed a cunning plot. They hashed a cunning plot. They started hiding behind the bushes and trees. No one could face the son of Umul Banin. No one could face the son of Ali in one-to-one -one battle. The new Abbas would have beheaded them. So they ambushed him. One accursed man moved forward and attacked and chopped off the right arm of Abbas. Abbas had the water skin on his shoulder. He immediately got hold of it with his left hand. Another accursed man moved forward and severed the hand of Abbas. Abbas from his wrist. Abbas quickly clashed the water skin with his teeth. And then the accursed enemy knew what they needed to do. They had to attack the soul of Abbas, the heart of Abbas, which was in the water skin. A barrage of arrows started coming towards Abbas, and one arrow pierced through the water skin. The water skin broke and so did Abbas's heart. All the water fell. And at that time, one arrow came that pierced through the heart of Abbas. And you know what, at that moment, at that moment, Abbas fell from his horse without his hands, <laughs> without his hands. Umul Banin used to go to Medina. In Medina, Umul Banin used to recite a noha in which he would say, Oh, my brave son, oh, my lion like son Abbas. The narrators tell me that they had cut your hands. No one could, no one could face Abbas in battle if his hands were intact. But you know what happened at that moment? An accursed man moved forward. Forward when Abbas was going through a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty, the arrow was pierced in his heart and a cursed man moved forward and I do not have the heart to recite that and a cursed man had a heavy iron club in his hand and he hit the sacred head of Abbas with that iron club and it is written in the books of Maktal. Before that, Abbas had cried out loud, Brother, come and help me. Brother, come and help me. But before Imam Hussein could reach Abbas, Abbas was hit by that iron club and he was martyred then and there. When Imam Hussein reached near the body of Abbas, he said something. He said something he did not say at the body of any martyr. He did not say when Ali Akbar was martyred. He did not say that when Qasim was martyred. When Aun and Muhammad were martyred. He said, Al-An, in Qasar al Now, my back.
has been broken. Now, indeed, my back has been broken. Allah lahmatullahi ala al-qawm al-zwarimeen. Rabbana wa lamna anfusana wa illim taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khwasirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum wa la'an a'adaihim ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.